Hi, I'm Matt DeWire. I'm a producer at Connecticut Public Radio, and I work on The Wheelhouse. We did not have a show this week because of live coverage of Amy Coney Barrett's Supreme Court confirmation hearing. In place of The Wheelhouse, I wanted to share a new program on Connecticut Public Radio called Disrupted. It's hosted by Kalila Brown-Dean. She's a professor at Quinnipiac University. You may recognize her as a panelist on The Wheelhouse. Disrupted looks at how the pandemic and the Black Lives Matter movement have changed life in the United States. Kalila and her guests seek to make sense of it all. I think there's some crossover with some of the topics that we discuss on The Wheelhouse. Hope you enjoy the show. According to Brookings, one out of every 1,000 Black men will die due to police violence. And Black teens are 21 times more likely than whites to be killed by police. These racial disparities and the deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and many others have led to massive protests and questions about justice. This is Disrupted. I'm Kalila Brown-Dean. Today, we'll hear from a panel of former and current officers, all of whom represent a perspective that often gets overlooked. Black officers at the intersection of debates over what the police do and what communities want. Our guests are James Scott, Assistant Professor of Criminal Justice at Albertus Magnus College. He spent 21 years as a Connecticut State Police Officer. Dr. Lorenzo Boyd is Vice President for Diversity and Inclusion at the University of New Haven. He's a former Deputy Sheriff in Massachusetts and a consultant for law enforcement. Chief Vernon Riddick Jr. is Police Chief for the Town of West Hartford, and Sergeant Shana Kendall is Deputy Commander of Training for the New Haven Police Department. Ask Sergeant Kendall about her journey to becoming an officer and her experience working in the community where she was raised. I actually was on the path to becoming an attorney. However, my brother was murdered in New Haven. Um, the, the course of events and how that investigation unfolded um, created a desire within me to um, become part of the police department so that I can aid my community, like the detectives who um, solved my brother's uh, murder case um, did for our family. So getting on the job for me was to create impact, to be part of the solution. So I am a New Haven native, I am a black female, and I'm a police officer. There, there are areas in which there is some division there, right? Because I react to things as being a witness um, and a community member, but also as a police officer. Um, and knowing and understanding that what is going on in the, in the climate in which we are in currently, um, there is some friction, right? And unfortunately, um, we don't get, when I say we, I mean um, officers of color, officers from the communities in which they serve who have um, invest, a vested interest in them, kind of get painted with this broad brush, right? Because people see my uniform. They don't see my character. They don't see what I stand for as a member of the community. They don't see how I stand up for what's right. My hope would be that we wouldn't necessarily be categorized or lumped all in together because you have officers that truly believe in the work that we do with the community and have their position so that we can um, impart and ignite changes because there are changes that need to be made. And I think that gets lost with, you know, seeing the multitude of events that's, that's occurred over the past six months to a year. Professor Scott, you spent 21 years as a Connecticut state police officer, and that also involves breaking some barriers and challenging some spaces where people who look like you or come from your community may not be represented. What led you on that path into law enforcement? Interestingly, I'm originally from New York, and the only reason I ended up in Connecticut was because an unnamed police department in New York didn't hire me because I believe I made a formal complaint some years ago. I didn't know how to articulate it then the way I could now, but it was, a, it was an improper uh, stop and search. And I made a formal complaint and believe it or not, in the interview at the time, they asked me about my complaint that I made against their department. And I 
ultimately never got the job. And that's kind of how I ended up in, in Connecticut. So New York's loss, it, it was Connecticut's gain then for your 21 years of service. Dr. Boyd, you are no longer a law enforcement officer, but you did have quite a career as a deputy sheriff. And now the work that you're doing to not only train students for careers, but to train other officers and other departments as well. What led you into law enforcement? And then what led you to make that career shift of now going into education? You know, my, my story is a funny story, and I applaud uh, the other people on the panel because I know a, a little bit of their backgrounds and how they got there. Mine was a little different. I was uh, coming out of my undergrad, about to graduate from the University of Massachusetts, and I got into an argument with my brother, who was a firefighter. So I wanted to show that I was smarter than him, so I took the test just to see that I could score higher on the civil service test. So I had no inkling of ever... Uh, going into law enforcement at all. And then when I got called by the sheriff's department, I figured I'd stay in about six months and then, you know, work on an exit strategy and then get a real job. And I stayed in uh, nearly 15 years. I got uh, my master's degree. I did a stint in law school and then got my PhD all while in uniform. And because of the questions that I had when I was on the job, dealing with people in the sheriff's department, um, dealing with people of color in Boston police and the people of color in the state police, I had questions about uh, race in policing. So the 20 year career that I spent as a professor, I've been doing a lot of research with race in policing and race in the community. I want to come back to you because I'm fascinated by how your perspective has changed from looking at race and policing as someone on the force versus now someone who is in higher education, which can often have its own challenges when it comes to representation. But Chief Riddick, you are police chief of West Hartford, but you are a Waterbury native. And I can imagine that the demographics of Waterbury and West Hartford are quite different. And yet I've heard you speak of some of the challenges that you also had to address as an officer in your hometown. What brought you into a career in law enforcement? Well, initially I wanted to be on the federal level, uh, whether it be the FBI or the Secret Service. And uh, to that end, after graduating from college, uh, I went to law school for a year. I'm not as smart as uh, Dr. Uh, Brown Dean, yourself, and Dr. Boyd, so I didn't finish. Uh, but I did that to because normally when they on the federal level, they like for you to have an advanced degree. So I figured I'd go to local law enforcement, get some experience, and then go to the federal level. Well, that didn't happen. I actually started my career in the Ansonia Police Department back in '93. Uh, transferred to Waterbury. Uh, went through the ranks, uh, retired from there, and came to West Hartford. So I always wanted to be in some level. I thought it'd be the federal level. Uh, once I came at the local level, I loved it. I saw that you can make a difference. This sounds cliche and it sounds corny, but it's true. Uh, and especially in my hometown of Waterbury, uh, to be a, a role model and to embrace it and to have to uh, crash through some barriers, being the first African American deputy chief, the first. African, actually the first minority deputy chief, the first minority police chief in uh, a city as diverse as Waterbury is quite uh, incredible. And uh, in addition, uh, the first black on the SWAT team to command it, the first black to be on the executive board of the union, the first black in internal affairs. So a lot of firsts. Uh, so I know it was the Lord's will. And as I come to West Hartford, I'm the first and only uh, black chief. So Chief, I want to continue on on something that you just said. It struck me that, you know, I'm from the South, so I try not to talk about age, but I'm struck in, in having this conversation with you that you're not that old, Chief. And so to think that you are still breaking these barriers and achieving these first within your career makes me want to ask the question, why? Why then, given the diversity of the cities that you have been a part of, of where you come from, what do you think those barriers are to having a more representative force and a more representative leadership as well? Uh, I won't bore you with the history of the of policing in America and their interaction with the African Americans, but I will tell you that uh, just because I was the first doesn't mean I was the first qualified. Uh, in the city of Waterbury, 
uh, Lieutenant Sam Beeman and Lieutenant Cicero Booker. They, I stand on their shoulders. They're, they are my mentors, were my mentors. Mr. Booker continues to be such. They had to sue the city of Waterbury for discriminatory practices and the testing practice. Uh, they showed how scores are being changed and everything else. So as a result of that, all we wanted was an opportunity. All they wanted was an opportunity. And when they made this lawsuit, they were patrol officers. And as a result of that, uh, Lieutenant Beeman was the first African-American sergeant, the first lieutenant. And on their sacrifices, myself, um, Chief Riddenauer, who's in Danbury now, were able to succeed. But all, and I put this in quotations, you know, all we had to do was perform and to take the test. They had the bigger fights. And uh, yes, we faced some discrimination, but nothing like what they had to go through. So I want to talk about that because you talked about what these leaders, because that's really what they were, pathfinders who went before you and what they experienced. And so for the rest of you, what kinds of challenges have you encountered internally within your departments? And you don't have to name a particular department, but speak to those kinds of experiences and challenges that you face. Professor Scott, please. Dr. Brown Dean, is it okay if I generalize? Of course. A lot of agencies claim that they can't find diverse applicants. I think they're just not looking hard enough. The irony of this is I met Dr. Boyd long before we uh, convened on this panel. When I was the commanding officer for the Connecticut State Police Recruitment Unit, I sent a blind email to him because I knew he was at a historically black college and university and I asked him, can I come down and talk to your students? And he said, absolutely. The scheduling didn't work out, but we made the connection and I was able to uh, forward the information to him all over email and, and phone call. I, I didn't know him. And I don't think enough agencies take that type of proactive approach. If there are not enough candidates here in Connecticut, well, where else are you looking? Dr. Boyd, you are vice president for diversity and inclusion at a university. And we hear that same theme all the time, that a university is not diverse, a faculty is not diverse, or a, a police department is not diverse because they just can't find enough candidates or they can't create that pipeline. From your perspective of being in these different spaces of power, you know, is that a valid critique that it's just hard to find people of color or uh, young African Americans who want to go into a career of law enforcement? Or is there something structural, as Professor Scott mentioned, that gives people convenient blind spots? I think it's really hard for them to find qualified people where they're looking. I was working with a major Northeast department trying to diversify, and they told me that they, they put flyers up all over the place. So I said, give me a list of the places. A lot of them were at Knights of Columbus Hall, the 4-H's, and places like that, or bars and pubs that they frequent. So I asked them, did you reach out to anybody in the black church? And I got silence. I said, did you reach out to any of the black fraternities and sororities? Nothing. Are you reaching out to inner city schools? Well, we don't know anyone there. So yeah, it really is hard for you to find qualified people if you're only willing to look at the tip of your nose, if you're willing to go beyond that. And, and speaking of uh, Professor Scott's email, the fact that I was struck by the fact that somebody wants diversity enough that they're going to where the people of color are, that tells me a real commitment to bring people in. And it's not hard. The other thing is, trying to convince people of color to go into policing, which is another thing, because when people finish my program, they come through, they've got a four-year degree. I tell people policing is a fantastic career for the right person. But the other side of the coin is they get out with the degree, some of them go to grad school, and now they're thinking about these white-collar jobs where they can work nine to five, they don't work nights, they don't work weekends, and people aren't yelling at them. So it's, it's kind of a, a double-edged sword. But there's an awful lot of people of color that are qualified, and the hiring process tends to be biased when we put so much emphasis on an interview where the biases of the people that are doing the interviewing can easily disqualify otherwise qualified people. Sergeant Kendall, part of the challenge then is not just to create structures 
and processes that allow for greater diversity, but also having people who are interested in that. And I'm curious, given this current political climate that we are in, given all of the tension in the country, what does recruitment look like right now? Is it more difficult to recruit candidates of color or do you find that people are saying, I want to be the one to make a difference and show that you can be a good cop, quote unquote, uh, regardless of the community that you serve? Right. So um, nationally, recruitment levels are dropping. They're just declining. They're not where they have been. We actually just wrapped up um, some recruitment for this, this next hiring process. Um, and whereas we used to get numbers 1,500 or more, we're now seeing at best 500 applicants. Now, uh, we have, with everything going on, we found that it was very important to reach people in places that we couldn't necessarily just travel to. We did a lot of um, Zoom conference, conferences where we had panel discussions for people to ask whatever questions that they would have, but it was very important also to put minorities in front of um, recruitment as well to show like there are minorities that are on the police department. There are police officers that are actually good, do good, follow the law and want to aid in the betterment of the system or the community. And so for us, it was very important in that aspect to, um, to identify that and also reach out to places in which we could hold meetings in which we have like a meet and greet. I will tell you, this climate has also made it very difficult because we have been met with resistance where we have contact with certain agencies or companies um, or schools even and asked if we can, um, you know, set up uh, a, a spot within their school, wherever they designated, just to have like a meet and greet session. And we were met with, we don't think that's a good idea. So you have that that you're working against also. Um, so a lot of it was word of mouth, getting the word out where we can, because there are a lot of questions about policing, right? Everyone is so um, so consumed with what we what we see, right? And if you've had a negative encounter with the police, that simply enhances your belief on what policing is all about in each and every police officer. So in trying to do that, um, we have identified places, even within the community, that we can go to and speak and identify applicants that obviously um, would pass the, the um, application process. That's Sergeant Shayna Kendall, Deputy Commander of Training for the New Haven Police Department. This hour, we're talking with a panel of current and former officers who are Black about this moment of heightened tension between police and communities of color. Our other panelists are James Scott, Assistant Professor of Criminal Justice at Albertus Magnus College, Lorenzo Boyd, Vice President for Diversity and Inclusion at the University of New Haven, and West Hartford Police Chief Vernon Riddick Jr. More after the break. This is Disrupted. I'm Kalila Brown-Dean. This is Disrupted. I'm Kalila Brown-Dean. Today we're talking to a panel of former and current officers about their experiences and how they teach future officers during this time of heightened tension around violence and accountability. Our guests are Sergeant Shayna Kendall, Deputy Commander of Training for the New Haven Police Department. James Scott is Assistant Professor of Criminal Justice at Albertus Magnus College. Lorenzo Boyd is Vice President for Diversity and Inclusion at the University of New Haven, and Vernon Riddick Jr., West Hartford Police Chief. In the last segment, we talked about police recruitment. With fewer people applying, how do we know we're going to get the best, most qualified people to do this critical job of policing our communities? I posed that question to Chief Riddick. It's a very difficult challenge, and it starts with education and a cultural shift and perception and reality. And it's something Dr. Boyd said 
you know, I hope we don't gloss over, you know, especially in the black community, it's not looked at to be a police officer as a viable uh, alternative, as a viable job. In West Hartford, the starting salary under our current car contract is $70,000. And within four years, you top out at $91,000. That's base pay, not including overtime or anything else. So you can make six figures very easily if you want to. One of the critiques that I have of myself when I was the Waterbury police chief that for five and a half years, that I, with the exception of my last year there, I was unable to increase the amount of minorities, specifically African-Americans within the Waterbury Police Department, trying to overcome that hurdle. When you have parents telling their children, why would you want to become a police officer? Why would you want to be a sellout? Why would you want to hurt your own community? We have to overcome that. And it has to be started within the home. Uh, what are we doing outside of that? I happen to sit on the post council, police officer standards and training council, and we'll be introducing, hopefully, if not this year, early in 2021, the history of policing and the impacts on minorities. We need to talk about that to educate our own people, as well as the police officers and, and, and our brother and sister Caucasian officers, because a lot of them don't know the history, and that needs to, leads to negative interactions. Uh, dealing here in West Hartford, and I can say at Waterbury, having the last say, people have been treated fairly. We have to change perception. We have to let them know you can be part of the problem or part of the solution. You're going to stand by the sidelines and say police are horrible, police are bad, or you can do like Martin Luther King did. Use the system to expose the system. The reason why he was successful is because he did not violate the law to show the violations in the law. He let his actions and the cameras do it for them. You want to change policing, you want to change perception, you got to get involved. You have to come in. An external fight in and by itself will not be successful. So Dr. Boyd, you know, speak to us about this tension of recruitment of choosing who will be able to come into a force or into a department and what you see from your perspective. I think one of the problems that we have is that we expect people of color right now to determine that, okay, we want to be part of the police and not acknowledging the negative history that law enforcement had with people of color since we were here. And a convenient history is that in 1828, Sir Robert Peel introduced legislation to start the, um, the London Metropolitan Police, and in 1829 it started. That's a real convenient history. The real history is in 1704, we started slave patrols in South Carolina, and that's where policing in this country actually started. Many of them were in the Klan, and that began the negative relationship. So we can take that through uh, the Jim Crow enforcement. We can take that through the civil rights enforcement. We can even take it as far as our stop and search. There's been a negative relationship between people of color and the police since people of color were brought to this country. So once we acknowledge that, I think it's the job of the police to then try to help out with, uh, with that relationship. And recruiting police is a two-part effort because po police recruiters aren't going to be nearly as successful if the people on the other side aren't working with it. So when I was a department chair for criminal justice at HBCU, I found people who said they hated the police. And those are the people that I chose to work with. Then I brought in different people. I did coffee with a cop. And I tried to humanize the people that were there. So when I did coffee with a cop in the fall, I asked every police officer who their football team was. And then every time a student came by, I'll say, oh, you're a Washington fan? I said, you know, the chief is a Dallas fan. What's up with that? And then they start bantering back and forth. And then they realize, oh, wait, he's just a person. Or Red Sox versus Yankees. And then people talk and realize that cop that I think I don't like is actually a person doing a job. So that's one way to make that connection. And part of my job was to get students to view policing as a real occupation. And right after the Freddie Gray case, when people were telling me, at the HBCU I was in in Maryland, how much they hated the police. The year after that, 19 of my students went through the uh, Baltimore Police Academy. I said, if you don't like the way the system works, be the change that you want to see. But that's an awfully big burden to put on the shoulder of a 22-year-old. 
I acknowledge that. But a lot of people decide to take me up on that. The flip side of that is policing really needs to clean its house. And we expect the police to keep fixing things. And that brings me to the final summation from the OJ trial when Johnny Cochran asked a rhetorical question, who polices the police? We need levels of accountability for these bad cops. And every officer that I talked to, and certainly every chief that I talked to, said they want to get bad cops out of their ranks just like everybody else does. So once we can clean up the negativity of policing, it won't be so hard to move people in. Professor Scott, you know, Dr. Boyd talked about that history of policing and how that history has really shaped perception and reality today. And I think Chief Riddick also references the importance of that history of thinking about, you know, Martin Luther King and others who realized that what they were fighting for was bigger than themselves. But I want you to talk to us about this current moment, because although these issues are not new, these tensions are not new, to some people, this moment feels different. So from your perspective and the kinds of conversations and interactions that you have with your colleagues or your former colleagues, what does this moment look and feel like for you? It's definitely a unique, uh, a unique moment. I try to uh, utilize all the contemporary issues that are happening to engage the students in the classroom who are going to be the next generation of practitioners. I try to give them an opportunity to uh, ask some of the questions that they may not feel comfortable asking a uniformed police officer and try to explain to them and give them a comfortable space to, to talk about it. And I'm completely transparent with them. Some of the things I don't agree with and I'm horrified by, and I, I share that same sentiment with them. But I, I also try to uh, encourage students to uh, seek uh, law enforcement as as a uh, as a profession, and not just policing, because we can't forget it's a it's an entire system, and 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 there are negative outcomes at all levels, not just with the uh, with the police. That system and the structure brings me to a lot of the public debate, Sergeant Kendall, that's happening after the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis. So that, again, even if people knew that there were these problems, I think seeing that in real time made some people respond in a way where before they had been silent. What does this moment look like for you as a law enforcement officer that is sworn to protect the community that raised you to understand that while George Floyd was killed in Minneapolis or, you know, Ahmaud Arbery was killed in Georgia, Breonna Taylor in Kentucky, that these kinds of questions and concerns are playing out in Connecticut and in New Haven as well? Right. So um, the, the George Floyd incident was... Um, and unfortunately, like so many others, um, was something that many of us found to be just wrong, right? It goes against everything that we were trained um, to, to use, to act, and to handle people. Um, so for me personally, I realized that, one, it affected me just being a, a Black woman, right? And then it affected me as being a law enforcement officer who upholds the law and tries to treat people in such a way that I would want them to treat my grandmother. And so it was it was very difficult because as a person, I felt as an African American woman, I felt that for his family, my family, my, you know, my brothers, my sisters who, you know, I have concerns about. Being in law enforcement doesn't remove those concerns that you have for your your family and interactions that they have with the police that I have no control over. Um, what I did when that happened, myself and some fellow uh, minority supervisors reached out to officers, right? Because you have to check in. You have to check in to, to see how they're doing. Are you okay? And that's what we did. And we had these conversations about it and realizing that Yes, it did. It does affect Connecticut. It affects New Haven. Um, these are things that we felt. They are things that you know we had to deal with because it's it's about policing and what police have done to the community. And so, 
moving forward, it, it was our it was our commitment to continue to try and work with the community. But I think the the sense of listening more um, and seeing exactly what it is that they need, as opposed to we're the police, this is what we feel the community needs. Um, and I think that that was a step in the right direction. And we could only improve from here, or at least that's our desire to do so from here. Just listening and trying to, to you know, merge this gap, this barrier that is thicker and, and more apparent than it ever has been. Um, and I think that takes with having some very difficult discussions in which the, the police are identifying, empathizing, and understanding where the community is coming from with regard to these issues and not always having a response. We have to do more listening to what the community needs and what the community wants from its police officers and shape that into where we move forward to. Too often those conversations happen after something bad has happened. And in that way, they can be very reactionary, which means that people question the authenticity. And so that notion, Chief Riddick, that you know this engagement, this conversation has to happen on the front end, because in some ways that can prevent incidents from happening, but it also builds trust. How do you as a police chief, one of few chiefs of color across this state, leading a department in a community that is often quite different from demographically from other places, how do you have that conversation of understanding that you have to be accountable to the community and you are the face of your officers who look to you for leadership? How do you have those check-ins and those conversations across those spaces? Without getting too deep, um, it's, it's my faith in my Lord and Savior. And, and walking that walk. Uh, throughout the last couple of years, I've embraced the responsibility and the challenge of being a police chief, which meant exposing some internal things and some personal experiences uh, that I would not have normally have shared in an attempt to validate the experience of those of the unknown that we don't know, that we think sometimes are just uh, putting out the race card. I've talked about personal experiences of seeing a burning cross I've talked about personal experiences of being called the N-word. I've talked about personal experiences of going inside a store and watching someone who has no idea that I am a chief of police or whatever come to, towards me with a broom, pretending like they're sweeping the floor to make sure that I don't steal something, not knowing that because I'm in a sweatsuit and a hat that I'm, I'm a professional and have a job. So I can relate to the experiences of our people. I can understand and have the fear when I got pulled over several years ago in South Carolina with my wife and my daughter and being nervous and, and hoping nothing bad happened during that motor vehicle stop. So sharing those experiences uh, to my officers. And again, my police department is 95% white. When I was in Waterbury, believe it or not, it wasn't that far off. It was about 90%. So you have to share the experiences because many of our, our white brothers and sisters just can't relate through ignorance. A lot of them would like to. And for us, you know, what really disturbs me, and I'll try and shorten my answer, is when someone becomes transparent and expresses their opinions, it does not look like us. We attack them as opposed to using that situation for conversation, change, and dialogue. So by me sharing my experiences, now my officers here can understand that when other people mention these things, they're not making it up, all of them, and they're not just trying to garner attention. It's their true life experiences. So we've had some very difficult conversations. All these recent shootings, we talk about them at roll call, we play the videos at roll call in our staff meetings, and I tell them that I have some of these same feelings, even today, and I've been criticized for that by some colleagues, but I say, hey, if I get pulled over, I'm nervous. And that's a shame. I appreciate you for sharing that, Chief Riddick, because I think it speaks to the complexity, not just of this moment, but the challenge of deciding what do we do if officers who are Black and who have taken this oath 
still experience these kinds of doubts or are able to understand how those perceptions and biases play out, if you all still experience this, if you are pushing back against the negative perception, then Dr. Boyd, what do we do to reform this system or reform this relationship? We had this new police accountability bill in Connecticut. It was a very contentious debate. There were questions about, you know, whether reform should come outside of departments or internally. There's a national conversation about defunding the police. What do you think will be most effective to get toward a more positive relationship and the kinds of outcomes that Chief Riddick and Sergeant Kendall are working on every day? The short answer is we need to build levels of empathy. And I do police training all across the country. And uh, some years I do 280 hours of training of police officers. That's roughly equivalent to a seven week police academy worth of training that I do. And when I do my initial training, I bring in community members into the training, at least for the first couple of hours or so, because I need the police to understand the lived experience of the people that they're actually policing. I need the police to understand and hear what happens after you walk away, what happens after the arrest, what happens when you come there, what do people think when they see you rolling up. But the flip side of that is I need community members to understand what's going on in the mind of the police officers when they're rolling up the things that they don't see, the things that they don't know what's going on. In a traffic stop, yeah, you may be thinking he's going to ask me for my registration, so I'm going to go fumble through my glove box. But when I'm in the car behind you with my takedown lights on, all I see is that you're reaching and you're fumbling, and I don't know what you're doing. I don't know who you are, so that gives me a a heightened level of uh, response. I try to get both sides to see that. I do a lot of uh, scenario-based trainings, and I have Uh, Police officers and community members act out scenarios, but I have the citizen act as the police officer and the officer act as the citizen because I need them to see each other's eyes. I need them to see how things are viewed. And it's a really, really, really slow process. In Connecticut, if police training is 905 hours and if 80 hours of that is firearms and 10 hours of that is de-escalation, people are going to default to what they do the most. So the more we can have people work on communication skills, work on de-escalation, then the easier it's going to be for that to happen. It's really easy to say, I hate policing in general. It's a lot harder to say, I hate Chief Riddick or I hate Sergeant Kendall. It's, It's harder when you know the person. So the more we can get community members and police officers together in the same room, I think that's a step in the right direction. That's Dr. Lorenzo Boyd, former police officer and vice president for diversity and inclusion at the University of New Haven. Coming up, more conversation with our guests, Sergeant Shayna Kendall, James Scott, and Chief Vernon Riddick Jr. I'm Kalila Brown-Dean. This is Disrupted. This is Disrupted. I'm Kalila Brown-Dean. Let's continue our conversation with our panel of former and current officers who are Black. We're talking with Sergeant Shana Kendall, Deputy Commander of Training for the New Haven Police Department. Lorenzo Boyd is Vice President for Diversity and Inclusion at the University of New Haven. West Hartford Police Chief Vernon Riddick Jr. and James Scott, Assistant Professor of Criminal Justice at Albertus Magnus College. I asked Professor Scott about calls to defund the police and how he feels about shifting resources away from police departments. I wish the conversation wouldn't have started with defund because when a lot of uh, my former colleagues, when I talk to them, and this is just anecdotally, when they hear that word defund, they're automatically turned off because it sounds like you're taking something away from us. You're taking something off of our, our table. And some communities are only graduating 50% of their high school students, but we're not talking about defund the Department of Education, so why are you talking about defund the police? So I think maybe we should change the the terminology and I think we'd get a better uh, reception from um, the police perspective. Um, Also, you mentioned about the uh, the accountability uh, 
Bill. I think from the perception of a lot of my colleagues, law enforcement really didn't have a voice in the legislative process. So some of my colleagues feel, former colleagues feel as though it's um, anti-police, if you will. And now they are apprehensive about doing policing or, or any type of proactive police work out of fear of, you know, they're going to be scrutinized and arrested for doing their job. Sergeant Kendall, one of the things I want to carry out on that thought from Professor Scott, one of the things that I often hear said to civilians, particularly young people, is that if you're not doing anything wrong, you have nothing to worry about, right? Don't put yourself in a situation where harm could come to you and you'll be okay. You know, if, if that's the message that we give to residents and to civilians, why doesn't that hold true for law enforcement? As Professor Scott said, some people are now afraid to do their job because they think that they will be made an example of or they will be put at risk because they are actually trying to do their work. So there's two parts of that. So, yes, we do say, you know, just don't put yourself um, in these situations where you put yourself at risk. But the reality is, is that you could simply fit a description and you may not have put yourself there, but based on what you look like or what you wear, you're in that position by, by no actions of your own. Um, now, when it comes to police officers, I personally can attest to the fact that there is some apprehension, especially now with what can we do? What do we do? Um, because there is that innate fear that you're going to be the next YouTube sensation or Facebook or whatever the case may be. Um, and, and that is creating a, a breakdown. So now that is creating police officers who fear doing what they know they can legally do and how they can legally perform their job to now I feel like that moves towards disserving, like disservicing the community in which you know, we're, we're tasked with serving. Um, there are a lot of problems with that. Um, one, because an officer can have the confidence that they have, which is bred through one, knowing the law, knowing what you can and cannot do according to our policy and guidelines. However, having to think about things that are completely outside of the scope of what officers are dealing with at that given moment shouldn't be there. If officers are facing an incident with a gunman, a robbery, or a very hectic scene, um, things that are running through their minds should not be, am I gonna get sued over this? Am I going to have to go to the chief's office? Am I now gonna be on admin duty? Because that takes away from their ability to act um, in the face of what they're confronted with at that time. You know, I'm always curious when um, we hear about that hesitancy. And so Dr. Boyd, you mentioned Baltimore. And I remember after uh, Freddie Gray's death that there were a number of officers who called out during that time or who said that they were afraid to do their job because of how it would be perceived and that their fear was that it would then put them at risk because if there is a hesitancy in how to act, that you how in some way have now made yourself vulnerable as well. How do we navigate this then? A lot of this is cyclical. We saw this for about six or seven months after Ferguson and some scholars jumped on it a little too quickly, I think, and called it the Ferguson effect, which has since been disproven. It's happened in Baltimore uh, immediately after the Freddie Gray case. And we're starting to see it starting to happen uh, now a little bit with policing. But there are two prongs to that. Uh, I talked to police officers that say, a lot of encounters, I'm really nervous about the encounter because you know I could be sued or the other things that can't happen. So I'm backing off on the encounter. And I think that's a little funny because a lot of people in the black community are really afraid of the encounters as well. So I say you are now starting to understand what a lot of community members are feeling every time you roll into an area. So take that feeling that you have and be empathetic. My job is to try to make both sides of, uh, of both of these groups come together and see where there's levels of similarity. My job is to build bridges and to have police officers being really nervous is a positive thing. I can work with that because if they have this true feeling, then we can build on that. The problem I have is when police officers roll in and they feel invincible. 
there's nothing I can do with that. There's no teachable moment there. But the fact that the officers are afraid and I can get them to see this is the other side. What can we do to cut down on this? The other thing is if we have levels of accountability. I think it's it's hugely problematic that after the Breonna Taylor incident, that an officer was indicted for the three bullets that went through the wall and hit no one, but no one's held accountable for the six bullets that went to Breonna Taylor and ended her life when she did nothing wrong. So society sees that, the community sees that. People are upset. People are really angry and to wonder what's going on in somebody's life to one, protest against the government, two, protest against the police who have deadly force, and three, do it during a pandemic. That tells you people are really upset and we need to do something. We can't go business as usual. I think, I'm hoping this is gonna be the shakeup in, in society that brings both sides together so we can build out from here. So in the time that we have left, I'm going to ask each of you to, you know, reflect on this notion. Professor Scott, what's one thing that you wish communities would do in order to move forward together? I would like to see the law enforcement community partner more with higher education. I think it's a, a unique opportunity. Uh, being on a college campus, we truly, on our borrowed term from the military, we're a force multiplier. Um, it's important to do more than just come to the uh, career fair and pass out leaflets, really engage. And um, I extend the, uh, the invitation to my colleagues on the panel. Anytime you wanna come to my classroom, if you wanna zoom in, or it, it doesn't matter. You're, you're always welcome to any of my classes. You tell me when and you have a free pass. You have the whole time. Thanks, Professor Scott. Dr. Boyd, what's one thing we can do to move forward together? We need to talk. Too many times people are not talking. Community members always complain that the police aren't listening to them. And the police are always saying that the community is not willing to talk to them. So if we can get people together in the same room to talk, I think that's, that's a pathway forward. Sergeant Kendall, from you, what would be a recommendation or your wish to move forward? Um. I share the sentiments with everyone here, right? We have to be able to communicate. And I mean, not a, not selected community members, right? Not the community members that we think will behave nicely, but literally just have an open forum of community members that would like to attend and be a part of a discussion and a dialogue. Not to where they have to worry about, you know, police being police and perhaps even in civilian attire. Um, but, you know, I share the sentiment with both Professor Scott as well as Dr. Boyd that we just have to open up lines of communication. And sometimes that communication has to be initiated by us. And we can't be afraid to do that. Chief Riddick, last word to you. How do we move forward together? After prayer, there'll be a mutual respect and parties stepping out of their comfort zone and be willing to step forward with action for change. It's simple, it's to the point, but difficult to do. Thanks again to our panelists, Dr. Lorenzo Boyd, Sergeant Shana Kendall, Professor James Scott, and Chief Vernon Riddick Jr. Disrupted is produced by Daniela Luna and Katie Tolarski. We'll be back next week. I'm Kalila Brown-Dean. Hi, this is Wheelhouse producer Matt DeWire. There was no Wheelhouse this week because of live coverage of the Supreme Court confirmation hearing. I wanted to give you a chance to hear Connecticut Public Radio's new show, Disrupted. We've been lucky to have Kalila Brown-Dean on our show as a panelist, but now you get a whole show hosted by Kalila. Thanks for listening.